Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this third in the spring TUI lecture series by Professor Kelly Spurl. We've heard for the past two weeks uh, two women religious. Tonight we hear of a lay woman, uh, Elizabeth Lazur, late 19th century Parisian, early 20th century evangelist. Please welcome again this evening Professor Kelly Spurl. Good evening. Should I say bonsoir? When I conclude, I'll say bonsoir, comme à Montréal. With tonight's lecture, we move out of the early modern era and into times that are much closer to our own. The subject of my talk tonight lived at the turn of the 20th century in the cosmopolitan capital of a major European industrial nation. She was a laywoman, an ordinary upper middle class housewife with a husband she loved passionately, a large extended family, and a diverse body of friends and acquaintances whom she loved to entertain in her home, a well-appointed apartment on an elegant Parisian boulevard. She lived a life far more like that of our own than the lives of Mary Ward or Marie de l'Incarnation. Well, except for maybe the apartment in Paris. <laughs> but one thing she shared with Mary Ward and Marie de l'Incarnation was her Catholic faith and she tried as hard as she could to give witness to that faith as honestly and intelligently as she could. Unfortunately for her, the family and friends she entertained at her soirees generally were not interested in her religion, and when they weren't interested, they were openly hostile. Most painful of all, this woman's beloved husband, the one she refers to in her journal frequently as the man I love, the one I love most of all in the world, was bitterly opposed to her practice of Catholicism and made her efforts to do so a constant exercise in forbearance, patience, and self-effacement. Such adverse circumstances forced this woman to articulate the principles of an apostolate, an effort to evangelize, far different from the ones Mary Ward or Marie de l'Incarnation conducted in the 17th century. Yet I think we will see that these are principles that can be fruitfully embraced by anyone in modern society who wants to engage in respectful interreligious dialogue. Hence this woman and her writings are especially relevant to the purpose for which Walter and Mary Tui established this lecture series, perhaps even more so than any of the women my talks will address. The woman I am describing is Elizabeth Lesur, pictured here in an oil painting done by a family friend when she was in her uh, early middle age. Elizabeth Lesur was the author of a spiritual journal that was widely admired in Europe in the first half of the 20th century. Her writings are being rediscovered now at the beginning of the 21st century. I hope to convince you that the principles of the Christian apostolate that Elizabeth Lesur articulated, embracing tolerance, respect, and the evangelical power of good example, are ones that will always be relevant to interreligious dialogue. Let's start with Elizabeth's biography, which I'll admit at its outset has its soap opera dimensions. Elizabeth Lesur was born Elizabeth Arigi. She's, her family is actually of Corsican background. She's born Elizabeth Arigi in Paris in 1866 as the oldest of five children. Her father was a prominent lawyer, and most of the elders in her family were successful lawyers and civil servants. Elizabeth, therefore, came from the upper middle class, the so-called haute bourgeoisie, as opposed to the more, more modest, though affluent, artisan background of her near contemporary, Teresa of Lisieux. Elizabeth was educated privately into her teens and received excellent training in languages, literature, and in fine arts. Elizabeth remained a wonderful linguist throughout her life. She could read French, English, Russian, Latin, and Italian. Though she has many interesting things to say in her writings about the position of women in French society, Elizabeth was clearly raised not to work, but to marry and to devote herself to being a good wife and mother. 
In keeping with the customs of that level of French society, Elizabeth was baptized and observed all the practices of conventional 19th century French Catholicism. Following the expectations of her family, Elizabeth came out in society in her late teens and around the age of 20 met through mutual friends Felix Lesueur. Felix was five years older than Elizabeth. Uh, he was from the same educated upper middle cl class background as she, but he grew up outside of Paris in the city of Rennes. Felix was in Paris at the time he met Elizabeth, working on a medical degree, which he hoped would enable him to obtain a job with the French civil service in one of France's colonies in Indochina or Africa. Given the similarities in their background, it was probably predictable that the two young people would find each other attractive. A courtship ensued, which lasted for two years until the couple married in July of 1889. In the early years of the marriage, still hoping to pursue a colonial career, Felix wrote on colonial affairs for two journals, and it's significant that they were both rather notoriously anti-clerical. The journal's names were the République Française and Siècle. However, Elizabeth's family was convinced that Elizabeth's delicate health would not tolerate the rigors of the climates in Southeast Asia or Africa, and eventually persuaded Felix to join an insurance company connected to the family, where he worked as a director for the rest of his career. Felix was so in love with Elizabeth that he was willing to give up an ambition he admits he had cherished since childhood. The marriage between Elizabeth and Felix was at the root a very happy one. As you can probably tell from these rather serious mustaches, Felix was kind of a dashing character. He insisted that all his clothes and shoes be custom made. He had an expensive collection of rare books that he was always looking to expand. He wanted to cover Elizabeth with diamonds and furs and he was fully capable of driving 30 miles outside of Paris in an age without super highways or fast cars to try out a new restaurant. Besides his taste for La Dolce Vita, however, Felix also shared Elizabeth's interests in literature, the arts, and travel. So the early years of Elizabeth and Felix's marriage was busy and enjoyable. I've already mentioned that Elizabeth suffered from compromised health. She had been troubled with what Felix, Felix calls in his writings about her hepatitis uh, since childhood. She had a serious bout with an intestinal intestinal abscess, a fistula, shortly after she was married. It was probably as a result of the two problems that she never seems to have been able to conceive, and so the marriage was childless to her great sorrow. Nevertheless, the couple was able to keep up a lively schedule of entertaining cultural events and extensive travel that eventually included Italy, the Middle East, Russia, and Eastern Europe. Now, trouble in paradise, in this fundamentally happy marriage, began somewhere in the early to mid-1890s, and the cause was religion. Felix had been raised the same sort of conventional Catholic that Elizabeth had been raised as, but while in medical school in Paris, under many of the influences I will shortly describe, Felix had abandoned the practice of Catholicism and become an, a convinced atheist. However, when he and Elizabeth married, he promised not to interfere with her observance of Catholicism, an arrangement perfectly in keeping with what scholars call the feminization of Catholicism developing in 19th century France. Now this arrangement, this mutual agreement, you know, Elizabeth would be Catholic, Felix would stay home and read the paper, uh, held for a while, but then Felix became more and more annoyed with Elizabeth's practice of Christianity and wanted her to stop it. His general attitude seems to have been, you know, Elizabeth, you're just too smart to be doing this Catholic thing. Felix tried all sorts of things to get Elizabeth to stop practicing Catholicism. He made fun of her little pieties. He took to calling her after a sanctimonious character in one of the novels of Amy Zola. He fussed if Elizabeth didn't serve meat at Friday night dinner parties in violation of the fast laws then observed. 
He could get testy if she went off to mass during the week in addition to Sunday, you know, kind of accuse her of being a real holy roller. Felix actually succeeded in getting Elizabeth to stop the outward observance of Catholicism by the year 1896, and this seems to have lasted for a few years. In 1898, in keeping with his steady efforts to indoctrinate the highly, highly, Elizabeth, uh, highly literate Elizabeth with anti-Catholic polemics, Felix gave Elizabeth a book by the French biblical scholar Ernest Renan. We'll hear more about him in a minute. This book denied the divinity of Christ. This time, Felix's efforts completely backfired. Elizabeth was moved on reading this book to investigate its claims more closely by comparing it with the New Testament. In the course of her researches, she experienced deep adult conversion. That is, she became personally committed to the faith in which she had been conventionally brought up. Thereafter, Elizabeth immersed herself in Orthodox Catholic literature. She began to pray regularly, and she returned to the regular practice of the sacraments. In the year 1899, then, she began to write a journal documenting her spiritual life, in which she describes the struggles she endured trying to figure out how she could be, as she says over and over again that she wants to be, a Christian and an apostle, amid the bourgeois and secular atmosphere in which she lived and in the face of her husband's open opposition. It's a beautiful document, in my opinion on a par with its near contemporary spiritual classic, St. Teresa of Lisieux's Story of a Soul. Unfortunately, Elizabeth's compromised health deteriorated significantly around the year 1907. And not long afterward, in 1911, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, from which she died in May of 1914. Here is a picture of Felix and Elizabeth taken sometime during these years when she was reduced to invalidism, though she seems to have become something of a spiritual director for many persons in Paris, either conferring with them from her chaise lounge or writing letters of direction, which we'll see Felix eventually edited for publication. I just like to note that Felix looks like the good life is catching up with him. He's starting to acquire a certain Santa Clausy type appearance, which is, believe me, only going to get worse. Here we see, a, a, sadly, a pencil drawing of Elizabeth on her deathbed, done by the same artist who had done the lovely oil portrait of her in middle age I showed at the beginning of this talk. Now, despite the tensions their religious differences caused in Elizabeth and Felix's relationship, their marriage grew and prospered over its nearly 25-year duration. Elizabeth's journal and the introduction Felix eventually wrote for its publication amply testify to this. As I always say to my students, if Elizabeth's journal is a spiritual classic, it's a unique spiritual classic because it is, because it is filled with professions of affection of a wife for a husband. It's a testament to a very real, though imperfect, human love. Felix was genuinely devastated when Felix died. Now here's the soap opera denouement of this story. After her death in 1914, Felix read Elizabeth's journal and was so moved by its contents and especially its revelation that Elizabeth offered all of her sufferings for his conversion that he, the militant atheist, resolved to return to the practice of Catholicism, and he did so in 1915. Four years after that then, in 1919, Felix entered the Dominican order and was ordained a priest in 1923. Actually, Elizabeth had predicted this. She had said to him while she was still alive, she says, oh, you never do anything by halves. You know, he was ragging her. I'm never going to come back to the Catholic faith. And she had said to him, oh, I know you. You never do anything by halves. I know if you ever come back to Catholicism, for sure you're going to become a priest. She was right. Felix spent the rest of his life traveling around Europe, giving talks about Elizabeth's spiritual doctrine and editing her writings for publication. He had already published Elizabeth's spiritual diary or journal in 1917 under the title Journal et Pensée de Chaque Jour, 
By 1930, it had sold over hundreds of thousands of copies and had been translated into every major European language. Felix also edited The Letters on Suffering, published in 1918, a miscellaneous collection of her writings called The Spiritual Life, which came out in 1919, and another collection of letters called The Letters to Unbelievers, which was published in 1923. And I'm going to quote a lot, quite a bit, from that last publication. Felix himself wrote a full-length biography of Elizabeth, The Life of Elizabeth Lesur, in 1931. Elizabeth's teaching enjoyed such popularity in Europe in the late teens and 1920s that Felix was encouraged to open the cause for her canonization, which he did in the year 1934. The cause proceeded for several years until it was stopped short by the disruptions of World War II, after which Felix was too ill to pursue it. Felix himself died in 1950. However, and this is kind of a fun fact to know and tell, the wife of the French ambassador had brought the teaching of Elizabeth Lesur to Argentina in the 1930s, which led to devotion to Elizabeth and the study of her writings that continue to this day. In fact, it was at the urging of a group of Argentine laywomen that the Dominican order reopened the cause for Elizabeth's canonization in 1990 and its ongoing. Now, if Elizabeth is canonized, she will join the limited ranks of married saints that the Roman Catholic Church recognizes, and for this reason alone, she is noteworthy. But as I suggested in my introduction, Elizabeth is also important because her own intimate domestic situation required her to confront and to somehow deal with the difficulties of giving witness to her Christian faith in a social milieu that did not welcome that witness. When Elizabeth talks about how people, oopsie, okay. talks about how people react to her um, conversion or reconversion to Catholicism in the late 1890s, she uses language that expresses the real hostility many felt to conventional Christian belief. Typical is one passage from the journal in which she reflects upon the conversation at one dinner party. Bitter suffering of an evening spent in hearing my faith and spiritual things mocked at, attacked, and criticized. Elsewhere, she talks of the utter incomprehension, the ignorance, prejudice, and irrational hostility that she encounters when the subject of conversations turn to religion. In one essay, she admits that many unbelievers in her circle are convinced that Christians in general are queer, narrow-minded beings. In another letter, more playfully, she invites the atheist fiancé of a close friend to come to lunch so that, he can, so that he can see that she is not a servant of obscurantism uh, or a fanatic or a frightful reactionary. Elsewhere in the journal, she notes ruefully, the love of God is the only eccentricity the world does not accept and will never accept. Why was it so difficult to be a Catholic Christian in turn of the century Paris? Why did Elizabeth face such criticism and disapproval from Felix and many of their friends for her religious commitment? There are many reasons for this. I will only cite some of the most important. First, Anti-clericalism had been endemic in French thought since the 18th century Enlightenment, and the French Revolution and its aftermath had witnessed numerous efforts to limit the influence of both the diocesan and regular clergy in French education and politics while granting equal citizen status to Jews and Protestants. The period of the Third Republic in France, generally seen as lasting from roughly 1870 to 1940, especially beginning in the 1880s, saw an effort to secularize education, to end the Catholic religious instruction that had been a mandatory part of all public, public education previous to this time. Elizabeth knew about this through her friendship with Amy Fievet the second of the correspondents to whom she addresses her letters to unbelievers. Mademoiselle Fievette 
was a teacher who had lapsed from the practice of Catholicism under the influence of an important promoter of secular education, Félix Péco, who was himself a liberal Protestant. The 19th century saw growing advances in science, especially in France. We can cite the examples of Louis Pasteur and Marie Curie, who is almost an exact contemporary of Elizabeth's. These advances generated support for the positivist philosophy of Auguste Comte. This philosophy insisted that only empirical science provided true, reliable knowledge of the nature of reality. Felix admits that he had fallen under the influence of positivism in medical school, as had a slightly older European contemporary whose theories would also deny religious claims on scientific grounds. This is Sigmund Freud. The 19th century also saw the emergence of higher biblical criticism. Liberal Protestant scholars in Germany were at the forefront of this development, but France had its representatives too, such as Ernest Renan, whose book was the catalyst for Elizabeth's conversion. The result of such scholarship was, as with Renan, often the rejection of classical Christian doctrine. In the political sphere, the 19th century witnessed the articulation of socialist theories of political organization, typified by the philosophy of Karl Marx, who notoriously declared that religion was the opiate of the masses. Lastly, the latter years of the 19th century in France were marked by ongoing controversy about the separation of church and state, which was finally enacted in 1905. The legislation ended the Napoleonic Concordat of 1801, which had provided state subsidies for diocesan clergy. Many saw this event as essential to free French society of what they saw as the church's destructive influence on the minds and hearts of French citizens. It provided, when it finally happened, it provided the definitive blow to anti-republican forces in French society, many of whom had sympathized in the past with the monarchist cause, the effort to bring back the monarchy, and who had seen a close alliance between monarchy and the church as necessary to a moral social order. Put it all together, there were a lot of reasons why people rejected not just Christianity or Catholicism, but all religious belief by the 1890s in France. From her writings, we know that Elizabeth was aware of these many factors, but she was aware of them not only from her reading, but also from her day-to-day -day interactions with members of her family and social circle. Members of the urban, educated haute bourgeoisie with connections to business, academia, journalism, and the arts. Felix and Elizabeth knew and socialized with many who either had no knowledge of Catholicism or who had explicitly rejected it. I've already mentioned Amy Fievet, the second of Elizabeth's correspondents in her letters to unbelievers. Also addressed in that collection were Jean Alcan, an assimilated, non-observant French Jew, and F Felix and Yvonne Le Dantec, the former a professor of science at the University of Paris, who had published a number of books of popular philosophy debunking religious belief. We can well understand that in addition to the criticism she encountered daily with Felix, and it occasionally broke out into the unfortunate marital meltdowns, you can ask me about that uh, after I finish. In addition to that, she, you can well imagine, she faced incomprehension and sometimes even mockery when the subject turned to religion at her dinner table. How did Elizabeth cope with this? As I've tried to lay out, Elizabeth was embedded in an environment that was highly diverse religiously, ethnically, and philosophically. She herself describes her home as a meeting place where, she says, the most diverse spirits and hearts congregate. She eventually came to accept this reality as providentially ordained by her, for her by God. In view of her situation, Elizabeth tailored her approach to evangelization accordingly. 
I would like to outline the specifics of that approach now. Early on in her conversion or reconversion, Elizabeth decided that argument per se was an ineffective means of converting unbelievers to Catholic truth. She says in the journal, quote, the farther I go, the more convinced I am of the absolute futility of religious discussions with unbelievers. The intellectual and historical standpoint to which they confine themselves is not sufficient in view of the phenomena of the interior life. Elsewhere, she notes with the French philosopher Blaise Pascal that religious faith opens the heart to mysteries that transcend purely intellectual reasoning. She is also aware that arguments about deeply held beliefs often provide occasions for displays of egoism and pride, two vices antithetical to the essential Christian virtue of humility. Hence, she resolves, quote, to avoid all, carefully all discussion on religious subjects. Prayer, example, words and deeds filled with charity and intelligence. These are the elements of fruitful controversy, unquote. Yet Elizabeth did not disdain intellectual activity as part of evangelization. She thought it did have its place in the apostolate and even thought that she had a special role to play in this regard because she had had the benefit of education herself. I mean, she also believed you don't bring up the subject of religion. On the other hand, you have to be ready if somebody else brings it up and asks you a question or says, what do you think about this, Elizabeth? She thought, you have to be ready for that, and to be ready for that, you have to prepare your mind. So she thought this intellectual activity that was important to the process of evangelization had two necessary dimensions. First, Elizabeth believed one had to have a solid knowledge oneself of Catholic doctrine and tradition the better to correct or clarify misunderstanding or ignorance of the faith when the opportunity arose. She didn't think that she had the excuse as a laywoman of leaving that to the parish priests. As many scholars will tell you, there weren't enough parish, pr parish priests in France at this time, and catechesis was, uh, you know, limited because of that. So she felt, I'm on the firing line, I have to be prepared. That Elizabeth made every effort to have this knowledge of solid knowledge of Catholic doctrine and tradition is clear from the extensive library whose contents Felix catalogs in an appendix to her work, The Spiritual Life. So first, you've got to know your own faith. Secondly, Elizabeth felt that the Christian apostle should make every effort to understand the point of view of those who would criticize her Christian faith. Whether that person was a socialist, a positivist, a Marxist, a liberal Protestant, or an atheist. In order to be able to do so, Elizabeth read widely in non-Catholic literature and seems to have striven to stay current in the new intellectual developments of her day. Writings about her mention her knowledge of socialism, of what she calls practical materialism, possibly a reference to Marx, the philosophy of Henri Bergson, as well as the pedagogical theories of the secularizing educator, Félix Pécot. The point of this effort, Elizabeth says, was, and this is probably my favorite of her many wonderful aphorism is, aphorisms in her journal, the point is, quote, not to accept everything, but to understand everything. Not to approve of everything, but to forgive everything. Not to adopt everything, but to search for the grain of truth that is contained in everything, unquote. To say something like this, one obviously has to have a fundamental respect for the views of others. And this respect is something Elizabeth speaks about repeatedly in her writings. One of her most articulate statements on this subject appears in another letter to the educator Amy Fievet. She says, quote, I have a total and absolute respect for each person's conscience and convictions. For me, that which transpires between God and human beings is something sacred, and nothing must intrude from an undiscerning hand." Unquote. She talks elsewhere about the need for fairness and even indulgence 
towards those who hold views other than her own. Something that she absolutely abhors in religious matters as revealing a lack of respect, fairness, and indulgence is fanaticism. In a long passage in the journal, she asserts, quote, fanaticism fills me with horror, and I cannot understand how it can exist with sincere conviction. Can anyone who loves Christianity passionately and wishes to see it reign in souls think for one moment he should use any method to achieve this goal other than persuasion? Can one instill conviction through force or deceit Besides, is there not in the use of such means something completely repugnant to the upright, loyal spirit that should mark every sincere Christian? Unquote. In his biography of Elizabeth, Felix notes that, quote, Elizabeth had a positive horror of declaring a priori and in a general way against something, against someone, against something, except evil. She liked instead to declare, moi, Je suis anti, anti, which we can translate. As for me, I'm against being against things. On this point, Elizabeth frankly admitted her repulsion at the fanatical statements that in her day often even fellow Catholics pronounced against Jews, Protestants, and atheists. Reflecting on the evils of fanaticism, Elizabeth continues, quote, and yet how many little acts of fanaticism we commit unconsciously. Apart from personal pride, we have the pride of faith, the most perfidious of all. We complacently scorn those of different belief and think ourselves hardly obliged to extend our charity to them. We consider that Jews, Protestants, or atheists are hardly our brothers in the true sense of the word, brothers who are deeply loved, who deserve our self-sacrifice, and upon whom we are obligated to bestow a respectful esteem." Unquote. The identities of the correspondence addressed in her letters to unbelievers serves as proof of Elizabeth's sincerity in this statement. All of the correspondence in this collection gives voice to Elizabeth's sincere affection for the addressees, an affection that is in no way compromised by their lack of Catholic faith. Elizabeth absolutely sees her correspondence as equal in dignity with herself. If anything, she often praises their superior moral worth, maintained without the support of religion to which she attributes whatever worth she possesses. Like the early Christian apologists, Elizabeth is convinced that Catholics and non-Catholics alike share reason with which they can perceive truth. In addition, she believes they can share moral virtues, such as love of truth and goodness and fidelity to duty. To Jean Alcan, the assimilated Jew, Elizabeth declares, I have, however, total confidence in God's ways of working with each person, even with those who never address God personally, and yet offer genuine homage by their love of the good, the just, and the beautiful. I believe that God inspires and directs all true reason and all who walk by its light, unquote. To Amy Fievet, she says, quote, We do not have the same ideas about everything, I know, and my beliefs are not fully yours. I say fully yours because love of the good, constant concern for the truth, and love of our fellow human, humans, all that we have in common which allows us to accompany one another on our journeys." Unquote. In a letter to Félix de Dantec responding to his book on atheism, which she frankly admits saddened her, Elizabeth insists, quote, in spite of yourself, the notion of conscience, of duty, of moral responsibility exudes from all your pores, and I believe that you often think about the immediate and distant consequences of your actions." Unquote. Given this common foundation of reason and commitment to virtue shared with non-believers, Elizabeth felt that the apostolate was in no need of brow-beating arguments. As she says, rather discussions should be marked by nothing singular, mean, or equivocal in one's attitude. Straightforwardness, simplicity, and when necessary, the quiet statement of one's convictions. <laughs> 
but never any ostentation in that statement. No extremes or partisanship. The key in all such encounters for Elizabeth was to approach souls, quote, with respect and delicacy, touching them with love, to try always to understand everything and everyone, not to argue, to work instead through contact and example, to dissipate prejudice, to reveal God and make him felt without speaking of him, end quote. And how will she do that? That She says in another journal entry, this is my last big quote from her, quote, it is not in arguing or lecturing that I can make unbelievers know what God is to the human soul, but in struggling with myself, in becoming with his help more Christian and more valiant, I will bear witness to him whose humble disciple I am. By the strength and serenity that I mean to acquire, I will prove that the Christian life is great and beautiful and full of joy. By cultivating all the best faculties of my mind, I will proclaim that God is the highest intelligence and that those who serve him can draw without end from that blessed source of intellectual and moral light." Surely there is much that is appealing and useful in Elizabeth's approach to the Christian apostolate especially for those in pluralistic religious environments, such as late 19th century Paris or contemporary American society. Yet I have to be honest and note that Elizabeth frequently admits in her writings that her policy of tolerance towards those who thought differently from her and her effort to be discreet in conversing with them caused her real tension. As she confessed to Jean Alcan, I am always divided between two contrary feelings, the fear of being a tedious philosopher or or of appearing to preach about things I've not done myself, and then the remorse of not having done all that I should have. In the journal, Elizabeth admits, it is a difficult thing to know how to reconcile apparently conflicting duties, to tolerate ignorance and prejudice without however seeming to accept them, to discriminate between that which is part, that which concerns ourselves alone and as such should be resolutely sacrificed, and that which is part of absolute truth and belief, and as such should be defended through struggle and suffering. From this tension comes Elizabeth's conviction that her challenge as a confessing Catholic Christian is to master what she calls the science of reconciliations. That is, in her own words, I must profess strongly and simply a faith that divine labor has at length created in me, but I must do this in a way that never wounds or offends conviction or its absence in others. Now, part of the reason why Elizabeth felt that pursuing the science of reconciliations was challenging and in some instances disconcerting was that the French Catholicism of her day was in many quarters unreceptive to such a project. As I noted earlier, during the period of the Third Republic, the Catholic Church's cultural dominance in France was being eroded by the increasing secularization of education and by growing agitation for the separation of church and state. Many French Catholics reacted with vitriol to these developments, attributing them to the pernicious machinations of Jews, Protestants, and Freemasons. Elizabeth, by contrast, seems to have accepted these changes with equanimity. There is no question that she rejected some on the Catholic right who still held out hopes for the restoration of the French monarchy. She more than once speaks approvingly of democracy. Likewise, she insists upon the need for complete religious liberty, suggesting that she may not have felt threatened either by the secularization laws or by the end of state subsidies for the church. Certainly, Elizabeth would have been repelled by the virulent anti-Semitic rhetoric that filled the pages of Catholic newspapers such as La Croix, run by the Assumptionist Order during the Dreyfus Affair between the years 1894 and 1906. And it is likely that such rhetoric provides the occasion 
for a number of remarks critical of anti-Semitism in the journal. Such clerically sponsored hate speech would have constituted exactly the kind of wrongful political exploitation of religious feeling that Elizabeth abhorred. Indeed, perhaps a vignette Felix reports in the introduction to the Letters to Unbelievers best illustrates the distinctiveness of Elizabeth's tolerant stance among the French Catholics of her day. According to Felix's account, a prominent industrialist summarized his reaction to Elizabeth's public journal, published journal with the scandalized cry, Cette femme n'a pas de haine! This woman has no hatred! As if to say, what on earth is wrong with her? So if French Catholic culture was in some quarters hostile to the kind of tolerance Elizabeth professed, where did she get support for her viewpoint? In articulating her vision of the Christian apostolate, Elizabeth seems to have looked to both remote and recent strands of Christian tradition. In keeping with Leo XIII's privileging of Thomistic theology and philosophy in the 1879 encyclical Eterni Patris, Elizabeth, who had a copy of the Summa Contra Gentiles in her library, may have found confirmation for her views from Thomas Aquinas' assertion that real moral virtue could exist in unbelievers. <clears throat> Scholar Janet Ruffing, editor of the most recent scholarly edition of Elizabeth's writings in English, which I highly recommend and also held by John Carroll Library, um, notes that Frederick Faber, the Oxford movement convert to Catholicism with whose writings Elizabeth was familiar because she could read English, also stressed the importance for Catholics of friendliness to all humans, especially to non-Catholics. Closer in time and culture to herself, Elizabeth knew and was likely influenced by the writings of Georges Guyot, a devout lay Catholic who supported republican government and constitutional separation of church and state. Significantly, Georges Guyot was involved in a projected plan to hold a parliament of world religions uh, in Paris to coincide with the great exhibition of 1900. The first Parliament of World Religions was held in Chicago in 1893 to coincide with the great Columbian exhibition. It brought together representatives from many Eastern and Western spiritual traditions for what is generally regarded as one of the first attempts in the West at formal interreligious dialogue. Elizabeth had several of Guayot's books in her library, and Felix says that he was perhaps the contemporary Catholic intellectual whose works she read most eagerly. Guayot himself may have found encouragement for his activities in Leo XIII's own efforts during his pontificate to seek unity with the churches of the Orthodox and Anglican Christian communions. Though it must be admitted, Leo condemned the sort of interreligious dialogue conducted on the basis of equality that the Parliament of World Religions represented. One last possible influence on Elizabeth's approach to the apostolate is that dimension of progressive French Catholic thinking that generated what is called the Americanist controversy in France in the late 1890s. This is a complicated controversy to explain, but it's very interesting. The controversy traced its origins to the publication in the United States in 1891 of Walter Elliott's biography of Isaac Hecker, the founder of the Paulist Fathers. We're going to hear more about Isaac Hecker next time in my lecture on Rose Hawthorne, but I'll give you a bit of background now. Hecker was born in 1918, in, uh, no, 1819, in New York City. He's the son of, of German immigrant parents. Raised by a Methodist mother, Hecker established ties in the 1840s with the transcendentalist movement that grew out of American Unitarianism. He eventually converted to Catholicism and was ordained a redemptorist priest, and the redemptorist order focused on giving missions. 
Hecker eventually left the order, actually he was expelled by it, but that's a whole other story, to found the Missionary Society of St. Paul, otherwise known as the Paulist Fathers. This order was devoted to Catholic evangelization of the United States by means of lectures and mass media. Significantly, Hector thought a vigorous Catholic apostolate was in no way incompatible with the American constitutional doctrine of separation of church and state and religious freedom in a pluralistic society. Now, some bishops in the United States saw some of Hecker's ideas as helpful in their efforts to build a robust Native American church at a time when debates were going on as to whether the church should encourage Catholic assimilation to broader American society or sectarian insularity within specific ethnic enclaves. As in France, some of these debates centered on education. In America, they concerned the question of public versus parochial education for Catholics. According to one of Hecker's con uh, contemporary biographers, bishops supportive of Hecker favored rapid Americanization of immigrants, more progressive education of the clergy, and positive encouragement of religious liberty and church-state separation. Now, one of these bishops, John Ireland of St. Paul, Minnesota, wrote a glowing introduction to this biography of Hecker that comes out in 1891. Now, because their government in the late 19th century was also contemplating constitutional separation of church and state, many liberal leading French Catholics seem to have looked to the ideas and work of Isaac Hecker for reassurance that such constitutional change would not necessarily hurt the church or its outreach in French society. Consequently, Walter Elliott's biography of Isaac Hecker was translated with considerable revision and published in French in France in 1897 with an even more commendatory introduction by a certain Abbe Felix Klein. The book eventually generated much discussion among French Catholics, again, in the context of pending legislation regarding separation of church and state. Very generally, one can say that liberals who supported the separation were favorable to the biography. Conservatives who did not support the separation were not. However, within a very short time, the biography and its various introductions by both American and French prelates gave rise to charges that those who praised Isaac Hecker and his admirers were guilty of Americanism. This was an amorphous body of potentially heretical ideas and attitudes, including the idea that the church must accommodate some of her doctrines to the circumstances of modernity, an overstress on the need for freedom of opinion uh, for Catholics, a disrespect for external ecclesiastical authority and a disparagement of traditional religious vows. The charges generated still more controversy aggravated by the outbreak of the Spanish-American War in 1898. The controversy was brought to an end with the publication in 1899 of Leo XIII's encyclical Testum Benevolentiae Nostrae, which condemns uh, several of these theses as associated with the alleged heresy of Americanism. Now, it's unclear to what extent Isaac Hecker or his admirers actually held any or all of the views associated with the Americanism condemned in Leo XIII's encyclical. However, I note that this controversy broke out in France in the years immediately surrounding Elizabeth Lesseur's return to Catholic practice around the year 1898. It is therefore possible, and I think even likely, that Elizabeth was familiar with it. Significantly, Abbe Klein, author of the preface to the French edition of the Hecker biography, had been involved with Georges Goyot in plans to hold a world parliament of religions in Paris in 1900. He is another witness besides Georges Goyot then to interest among French Catholics for interreligious dialogue conducted in a context of equality, 
and which might have conditioned their enthusiasm for a Catholic figure, Father Hecker, who pursued evangelization in a pluralistic country that offered freedom of religion to all citizens. Moreover, in the French introduction to the biography, Abbe Klein stresses certain aspects of Hecker's spiritual doctrine that I think Elizabeth would have found compatible with her own. Among these was the interest uh, was interest in the task of converting non-Catholics um, or non-Christians, the need for an intellectual crusade among Catholics expe- ex- expressly against militant rationalism, the importance of respect for others' opinions, an emphasis on the importance of interior life guided by the Holy Spirit as a necessary complement to the external practice of the faith within the institutional church, the possibility and duty of introducing holiness into all secular settings, and finally, the need for optimism in confronting the future. While I think the affinities between the ideas of the Americanist admirers of Isaac Hecker and of Elizabeth Lesur are real and can be supported on the basis of specific textual evidence, it is difficult to prove that Elizabeth was actually influenced by reading the works associated with the Americanist controversy. The French translation of the Hecker biography does not appear in the bibliography Félix Lesur cites at the end of The Spiritual Life. On the other hand, in view of the papal condemnation of Americanism in 1899, Felix would have had every reason to obscure or deny the influence if it existed in the interest of preserving Elizabeth's reputation for Catholic orthodoxy. We should remember that when Felix starts writing about Elizabeth in 1917 with his extensive introduction to her journal, he does so in the wake not only of the Americanist controversy, but of the modernist controversy and thus at a time when all Catholics, even the most pious, were subject to searching scrutiny for signs of heterodoxy. In fact, Felix makes a special point in the introduction to the published edition of the journal to say that when Pius X promulgated the encyclical Paschendi condemning modernism in 1907, Elizabeth understood and affirmed the encyclical's contents, which he cites as further proof of her doctrinal soundness. What the Americanist controversy does is reveal more about the attitudes of progressive Catholics in France at the end of the 19th century. And I think it is clear on the basis of her writings that Elizabeth shared much in common with this wing of the Catholic Church in France. I must say in closing that I find a certain pleasing irony in this history. You may, I hope you have, already discerned that I have a great admiration for Elizabeth Lesur. I was in fact involved in republishing the original English translation of her journal in the mid-1990s when I was working for a small Catholic publishing firm in New Hampshire. I believe that her beautifully articulated policies of tolerance and respect have much to contribute to the conduct of the Catholic Church's mission in American society today. It is an honor and a comfort to me to think that she may have derived some of these policies from the context of American Catholicism itself. Thank you for your attention. Bonsoir.